Hi, church family. I'm Suzanne Black, First Impressions Ministry Leader here at Real Life Church. So glad you could join us today. Please look on our contact page on our website at discoverreallife.net. We're so glad you're here. Now join us for a worship song. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, Oh 
is Prince of Peace, wonderful Counselor. When the waters rise, lift up your eyes and see. It is well, for He is King of Kings, Jesus Christ our Lord. When the waters rise, lift up your eyes and sing. It is well. Hey, Real Life Family, we are so excited to share with you guys some of the neat things that God's been doing these last several months. You know, when the pandemic began, a lot of things shut down and closed. You had businesses and schools and even church buildings for a while were shut down. But one of the things that never closed down or stopped was God. And God continues to work in the lives of people, drawing them to Himself. And so we want to share with you guys some uh, exciting things that uh, some individuals, their next steps of faith that they have taken because God has continued to work in their hearts and lives. And so today, we're going to celebrate them taking their next step of faith of baptism. We're going to celebrate with them, and we want you to celebrate with us as well.
right, well, welcome, Real Life Church. So glad that uh, you guys are here today, and I want to welcome all of you who are here uh, in person, uh, but also all of those who are watching online this week. We're especially glad that you guys have joined us as well. Uh, as I said, Pastor Mike is taking the weekend off, so I get the, the honor of uh, sharing with you guys part three of this series that we've been going through called Peace in the Pandemic. And so we've been working our way through the 23rd Psalm. And uh, in part one, we talked about the, the characteristics of the great shepherd who leads and takes care of us, uh, who are his sheep, and, and how following the great shepherd brings peace. Then last week, we uh, looked at how the shepherd brings peace to us through his presence and through his protection and his provision for us. And today, that leads us to verse 3 in Psalm 23. And uh, before we get started, I want us to read those first three verses together uh, as we begin. So if you go and put that up on there and, and just read with me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He, makes, he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And, and I think that phrase right there, that he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake, is at the very heart of Psalm 23. It, it helps us understand why he would be our good shepherd to begin with and why he's bringing peace and provision and, and such care for us. And later in this series, uh, it'll help us understand why there is such a celebration and comfort even as we go through seasons of trial. And why we can be so confident that these things are true. Because you see, if the people of God ever needed to be led in anything, it was to be led in the path of righteousness. Because throughout our history, both yours and mine, and throughout the, the history of Christianity, the people of God can't seem to stay on the path of righteousness for very long. We see this in the giving of the law. And we see this in the great miracles God performed and it doesn't take long for people to forget God and to go their own way and do their own things and, and oftentimes that's true for me and you as well is it not we seem to be uh, on the path of righteousness you know we're being the person God has called us to be and yet somewhere along the way we get off track we stumble and we fall and we get off of the path and it's almost like that path is a very narrow path on a mountainside. And you're kind of clinging to the mountainside, hugging the mountainside, just to try and stay on the path without falling off the cliff. So the good news of Psalm 23, especially in light of John chapter 10, where Jesus proclaims himself to be the good shepherd, is that we're finally going to be led to the path of righteousness in a way that is not just about our external moral behavior. See, God wants far more for us than just being a good person. You see, God's plan for us is about more than just a, a resentful kind of submission. It's more than just a mindset that says, I better do this before God gets me. No, God wants you to experience freedom from the inside out. You see, God's not seeking a, a transformation of behavior. He is seeking and is leading you to a transformation of the heart that, that is rooted in the joy of your salvation. And that will ultimately change our outward behavior. But it's an inside-out process, not from the outside in. You see, outward transformation doesn't last because you're still the same old person on the inside. And for you to truly be transformed, it begins not with your behavior, but with your heart. You see, I believe many of us are enslaved to an idea of religion that is far different from how Jesus tells us to follow him. You see, the God of the Bible is interested in giving us a new heart, in giving us a new spirit, in giving us new desires. And that's why Jesus, the good shepherd, is leading us. Now, how he does that is pretty spectacular. In three places in, in John chapter 10, it says this. Jesus says, I lay down my life for the sheep. I lay down my life for the sheep. I lay down my life for the sheep. And the, lay, the laying down of Jesus' perfect, righteous life 
on the cross is about getting you and me to righteousness, getting us on that path to righteousness in a way that we can never be knocked off of the path. And Jesus on the cross is absorbing all of God's wrath towards our sins, all of our sins, past, present, and future. And he is absorbing that wrath fully and freely and for forever. And after he did that, he ascribes the righteousness to us so that we are seen as holy, as spotless, as blameless in the sight of God. And so when we surrender our life to Christ and we become believers, then we have been given the righteousness of Christ. We've been placed on the path of righteousness, and we can never be moved off of that path. Now, we're given new hearts, and we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. And over time, God will transform our external moral righteousness from the inside out. And while outwardly that external righteousness takes some time to develop, internally, you and I have been declared righteous from the moment of our salvation. And now when we're on this path of righteousness, allowing God to change us from the inside out, we can find peace. So let's look real quick at some uh, ways that we as sheep can experience peace on this path that the shepherd is leading us down. All right. First of all, we can experience peace when our burdens are lifted. We can experience peace when our burdens are lifted. Let me ask you, have you ever experienced that? I have. <laughs> All right, the, the day of my salvation, I broke down and I told God, God, I am tired of running from you. Please forgive me and make me into the person you want, want me to be. And I can tell you, man, it felt like the weight of the world had been lifted off of my shoulders. I, I felt a, a sense of peace and a sense of joy and a sense of freedom that I had never experienced before. But there have been many other times in my life when I had been carrying something around that had been bothering me or weighing me down. And it's only when I come to God and I, and I hand him my burden that I experience peace and joy and freedom. And I'll be honest, I'm kind of hard-headed. <laughs> and sometimes it takes me a while to get tired of carrying that burden before I lay it down. But I will say, as I've gotten older and probably a little bit wiser, I lay those burdens down a lot sooner than I used to. What about you? What burdens are you carrying around that you don't need to? I mean, let's be honest. All of us have them. You know it. I know it. God knows it. Look at what he says in Isaiah 53, verse 6. He says, all of us. You know how many all includes? All. <laughs> All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each has turned to his own way. You see, none of us are immune. We're all sheep. And a sheep that does not follow his shepherd is going to go astray. He'll get into messes and trouble that he shouldn't be in. In Solomon, uh, Solomon in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 25, he confirms this when he writes, There is a way which seems right to a man. But its end is the way of death. And honestly, as people, we are pretty arrogant to think that we know better than God. I know God says this, but I want to do that. And God being the gentleman that he is, he never forces us to follow him. We can choose a path that seems right to us, and he lets us go down that path. And hopefully we realize we've chosen the wrong path before it leads to death and destruction. And when we come to that real realization, the good shepherd is there, seeking out his sheep that has gone astray. Now, King David experienced this. Uh, he was a, a man who had experienced God's presence and victory in his life as long as he stayed on the path of righteousness. But David also experienced trouble and despair when he chose to leave God's path and go his own way. And in Psalm 51, we have from David a, a prayer of confession to God. And David composed this psalm after he had committed adultery with Bathsheba. 
and she became pregnant. So eventually David had her husband murdered on the battlefield. Yet even then, the son born to Bathsheba died as an infant. And David knew that his sin, that his going his own way, down his own path, had brought all the deception and trouble and death. He was guilty, and he knew it. So he comes before God, and he confesses his sin. And he confesses that his choices has, had caused him to move far away from God. And in verse 12, he says this. He says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me by your generous spirit. You see, the David that wrote Psalm 51 is the same David that wrote Psalm 23. So he knew what it was like to walk with the good shepherd down the path of righteousness. But David also experienced what it was like to go astray. So now David is asking God to put him back on that path of righteousness, to lift the burdens of his sinful choices and restore to him the joy of God's salvation. And here's how David did it, and here's how you and I can do it as well. Uh, three things David did. First was to confess, to confess. And the second thing that he did was claim. And then the third thing that he did was to continue. So confess, claim, and continue. So first confess to God, just like David. Where have you gotten off of the path? Confess to God whatever burden it is that you have been carrying around. And for some of you, maybe like David, it's a certain sin that you need to confess. For others of you, it's a certain situation or circumstance in your life that God says, hey, I'll carry that for you if you'll let me. Confess and give that burden to God. And second, claim the promises of Scripture. Claim the promises of the Good Shepherd that we find in Psalm 23. Claim 1 Peter 5, 7 that says, Cast all your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. So if we confess and claim and finally continue, that is, quit sitting in the briar patch that you've gotten yourself into and get up and move forward. Continue to give that burden to God. Don't take it back. Because we're awful good about that. We give something to God, but then we'll take it back. Continue to give that burden to God and claim the Scripture promises that He's given you. You see, peace from the shepherd is found when you allow Him to lift that burden off of you. But you have to allow Him to do so. He'll take it if you ask Him, but you've got to ask Him. So where else? Can we find peace from the shepherd? We also find peace when obedience is pursued. When obedience is pursued. In Genesis chapter 22, we are given a glimpse uh, into a test that God was giving Abraham. And sometimes God does test us to see how we will uh, respond and react. Will we respond and react in faith and trust? Or will we go astray? And go down the way that seems right to us. See, God tested Abraham's obedience by asking him to go and sacrifice his one and only son, Isaac. His one and only son that Abraham had waited his entire life for. But Abraham responds in obedience. And he is willing to sacrifice his own son. But God stops him. Before he kills Isaac. God says do not lay a hand on the boy. He said do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God. Because you have not withheld from me your own son. Your only son. Now that's a tough test of obedience. But Abraham knew that it was God's power and hand. That had given him Isaac in the first place. You see, Abraham was almost 100 years old, and Sarah, his wife, was almost 90. So Abraham knew that God was more than capable of raising Isaac from the dead if he indeed had to sacrifice him. And not only did Abraham experience peace because of his obedience, 
But you and I experience peace as well because of his obedience. All right, look at verse 18 in Genesis 22. It says this. It says, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed by your offspring because you have obeyed my command. And what's ironic is that in the, in the verses preceding verse 18, God declared that by himself, God would do for Abraham some very specific things that included blessing Abraham, uh, multiplying his offspring, and giving his offspring victory over their enemies without any conditions from Abraham. These were just things that God was going to do for Abraham. And then the Lord adds one more promise that applies to everyone who reads these words. The Lord says that in Abraham's offspring, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. The offspring of Abraham will lead through Isaac to Jacob and down through history to Jesus himself. And all the people of the earth have the opportunity to be saved from sin and included in God's family through faith in Jesus Abraham's offspring. And now here's what I want you to see. Verse 18 concludes that the Lord will do all of these things because Abraham has obeyed the Lord's voice. Now it's interesting to me that the Lord made all of these promises to Abraham without any condition, but now it is Abraham's obedience that is given as the reason for these blessings from God. And when you and I pursue obedience to God, we will experience his peace as well. But that peace can also have an effect on the other people in your life. So to find peace, pursue obedience. Now we're going to get very practical here. And we're going to finish up with uh, six practices for peace. So these are six things that you can do that I guarantee will bring more of the shepherd's peace into your life, okay? The first one is this, choose joy. Choose joy. And joy is just an acronym that stands for Jesus first, others second, and yourself third. Choose joy. In Matthew chapter 23, starting in verse 37, uh, Jesus lays out why this should be one of our consistent practices. He says this, he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That's priority number one in life. Your first priority is not yourself. Your first priority is not even the people around you. The number one priority in your life and mind should be loving God with all of our heart, all of our soul, and all of our mind. And the verse then goes on to say, you shall love your neighbor. So our second priority in life should be to love those around us. And it should include your physical neighbors, all right, the people who live beside you. But it also includes your family, your friends, your coworkers, your acquaintances, those people that you see at the gym now that they are back open. Your neighbor is whoever God puts into your path. And we are to show them the love that God has shown to us. And then the verse concludes, it says, you should love your neighbor as yourself. Did you know that you should love who God has made you to be? Now, I know there are things about yourself that you do not necessarily like. That there are certain aspects of your appearance or your personality but God loves it because he designed you that way. So you don't need to, to beat yourself up and tell yourself how worthless you are because of your failures. Don't listen to those lies. Instead, you need to remind yourself of what God says about you. You see, God has declared you to be a holy one. He has declared you to be a child of the king. And your love for yourself stems from who God says you are, who God has created you to be, not from any, any sense of self-worth because of accomplishments or achievements you think that you've done on your own. So this week, let me encourage you, check your priorities and choose joy. 
All right, the second practice what I want you to do is to choose to be different. Choose to be different. You know, there's a saying at our house that normal is overrated. What is normal in our society today? Normal is people who are overwhelmed, stressed, always worried about trying to get everything done. Normal people live paycheck to paycheck. They're always stressed about money. And when it comes to relationships, normal people are fighting all the time. And in marriage, it oftentimes ends in divorce. That in our culture is normal. The good news is that Jesus didn't call us to a normal life. Jesus, during his day, he was probably one of the weirdest guys that you would ever meet. I mean, he didn't play by society's rules. Some of the things he taught went against everything that the religious establishment had been teaching. You see, there, there is a God kind of weird that is a far better way to live than normal, than living like everybody else. And Peter writes about this to a group of Jewish Christians who had been scattered all across the Roman Empire because of persecution. So they are already feeling out of place. But listen to what Peter tells them. He says, but as the one who called you is holy, you also are to be holy in all your conduct. For it is written, be holy, for I am holy. Now, Peter's not saying be different just for the sake of being different. He is saying that the God who saved you and called you to a life of following him is holy. So if you're going to follow him, then you should be holy also. Now, now listen, holiness here does not mean perfection. Uh, holiness means being dedicated to loving God. It goes back to our priorities that we just talked about. Priority number one, love God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. You see, that's not a, a, a love when I feel like it kind of love. It's a love that I'm dedicated to, that I am committed to, and will pursue all of my life. And the difference between God and us is that God is inherently holy, while we, on the other hand, only become holy in relationship to Christ. And we only increase in practical holiness as we begin to mature spiritually. You see, the New Testament emphasizes the pursuit of holiness in this world. And the final attainment of holiness is only going to come in the world to come. So to be holy means that we are, first of all, set apart for honorable use. That we're set apart for honorable use. And if you adopt this mindset that, that I am set apart for God's use, then I can promise you, you will be different from the world. But you'll also experience the peace that comes from knowing your, your purpose in your life. Because your purpose is not found in money. It's not found in relationships. It's not found in uh, popularity. It's not found in an easy and comfortable life. Your purpose is very simply to be holy, to be set apart, to be used by God. Now, the third practice to help us find peace is to deny self. Deny self. And Jesus makes it very clear that following him will not be a life of ease and comfort. It may not be a life of, of health and wealth. Instead, it will include some suffering. It will include some self-denial. And to follow Jesus, it comes with a calling to stop living life for ourselves. Listen to what he says in verse 23 in Luke 9. He says this. He says, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Now again, this goes back to our priorities of God first, others second, and ourselves third. You see, you can't live a life like that unless you get in the habit of putting aside your desires of putting aside your wants so you can set yourself apart 
to be holy, to be different, to be used by God. You know, too many of us, we get it wrong in thinking that uh, living for ourselves, if we fulfill all of our desires, that that'll bring peace in our life. But I can tell you, it won't. And if you haven't figured it out yet, you will. That the peace the shepherd offers only comes when we deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow Jesus. And that's when you'll find peace. But I want you to see one other thing in this verse, and that is that this is a daily practice. He says, take up his cross daily. This is not just a one-and-done deal at the point of your salvation. No, this is an everyday practice that keeps us on the path of righteousness. All right, the fourth practice to help us experience God's peace is to become a servant. To become a servant. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, uh, Paul writes this. He says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. See, you and I, as followers of Jesus, we've been given a gift of freedom. And we're not only free from the penalty and power of sin, uh, we are uh, also free to deny ourselves and put our desires to the side and to serve others. But that doesn't come naturally. Uh, right? Our natural desire is to be selfish. Uh, our natural desire is to look out for number one. And that freedom allows us to serve others rather than ourselves and to serve others humbly in love. Not to serve others pridefully, but to serve others with a humble and gentle spirit. And if we choose to indulge our flesh and not serve others, then we become like a swamp, dead and, st and stagnant, with, with no water, no life flowing into us, and no water or no life flowing out from us. And I would much rather be a flowing river than a dead swamp. See, a river gains its strength and power from the water that flows into it. And then it pours new life into the land and the sea. The water flowing into the river is God's love and power that we can have as we follow, follow the shepherd. And if we will make it a practice to be a servant to others, then as God's love and power flows through us and into the lives of others, I can guarantee you that you'll experience more peace. Now the fifth practice, and you're going to love this one, is to embrace difficulty. Embrace difficulty. How many of you love to embrace the difficult things that come into your life? <laughs> Me neither. All right, I don't like it. But just because I don't enjoy it doesn't mean that I shouldn't do it. I, you know, I think of it, it's kind of like eating vegetables or, or working out. You may not enjoy doing it, but you know if you do it that you will be better off for it. So Paul tells us in Philippians uh, chapter 2, verse th th 13, he says, For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. You see, one of the unenjoyable truths about God and life is that comfort is the enemy of growth. And when we are comfortable in life, we tend to set things on autopilot. And we just kind of cruise. And we go through the motions because there's not much in life that requires our undivided attention. But when difficulty comes... It makes us sit up a little straighter. We might have to actually get up out of our lazy boy comfort chair to see what's going on and why. And for me, when I am faced with, with challenges and difficulty, I do not enjoy it. But I tell you what it does. It forces me to become very dependent upon God. And my prayer life increases greatly. And because of that, my walk with Jesus, the shepherd, becomes closer. 
uh, I am more in tune with God and what He is saying. And I spend more time in Scripture during difficult times than when things are comfortable. So if you will begin the practice of embracing difficulty instead of ignoring it or running away from it, I will promise you again that you will experience the peace of the shepherd. Because what you're going to find is that he is walking right beside you, leading you down the path during the storm. Now the sixth and and final practice uh, to experience uh, peace is this, to simply to be obedient. Be obedient. And we've already talked about the benefits of being obedient as seen in the life of Abraham. But this is a theme that we see all throughout Scripture. And it's one that you and I have hopefully experienced in our own lives. We see it in what the prophet Samuel says in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. He says this. He said, Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. See, God is glad that you're here today, or that you're watching this service online. But I can tell you, His joy will soar if you will actually do the things we've talked about today, rather than just being able to say, well, I went to church. I mean, if you come to church, great. If you give an offering, great. But God wants more than your attendance at a service or money in the offering box. What he really wants is your heart. And what he really wants is to be the number one priority in your life. And and that peace you've been missing will only happen if you will be obedient in doing what he's called you to do today. Now, before we close today, I want us to go back to Psalm 23, verse 3, for just a minute. Because I I think it's key, if we're really going to get this concept, and if we're really going to be set free by this idea, that we have to look at the last phrase at the end of that verse. It says, He leads me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. You see, the idea that it's about God's goodness, not my goodness. It's about God's glory, not my own. And it's about God's power, not my power. That is the key to joyful Christian living and transformation. Because if I think it's about my goodness, then when I stumble, when I struggle, when I fall off of this external moral righteous path, well, then I tend to think how disappointed God must be in me. And we begin to think, well, I can never stay on God's path. But because it's about God's goodness, about God's strength, about God's power, not about my goodness or my strength, then in my weakness, God is still strong. And in my frailty, He is still powerful. And in my lack of faith, He is still faithful. See, that phrase, for his name's sake, it becomes my anchor. And it lets me believe that although I am a a weak and frail person who is prone to certain impulses, the the good shepherd is still leading me beside still waters. Not because I deserve it, but because he is good. He leads me into a green pasture not because I'm worthy, but because he is generous. And this fact, it should lift my eyes off of my frailty and onto his glory in a way that produces joy. And that that joy becomes the fuel for my obedience. And that obedience begins to transform my external moral righteousness. So I want to encourage you today that God's commitment to you His love for you, his desire to bless you, his willingness to give you the peace we've been reading about. It's not built around you, and it's not built around your performance. It's built on who he is, on his glory, 
in his namesake. So be encouraged that God's love for you is bigger than any weakness, any struggle, any doubt, any fear, or any weariness that you might have. Because you serve a God who overcomes it all. You serve a shepherd who can lead you down the path of righteousness. Now I'm going to ask you just to bow your head and close your eyes for a few minutes as we close today. Now if you call yourself a, a follower of Jesus, then you have been placed on the path of righteousness by the Spirit of God through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if you're not there, then God is inviting you to come on the journey with him. He invites you to let him transform you from the inside out. To become that person that he made you to be. Not through changing your behavior, but through changing your heart. And if you're watching today, and if you've never accepted God's offer of salvation, the forgiveness of your sins and a chance to allow him to become your shepherd and lead you through life, you can do that right now. And one of the best ways to do that is to say just a simple prayer to God, expressing your thoughts and your feelings. And if you're not sure what to pray, then pray something like this. Pray, Dear God, I am sorry for the sin in my life. I know that I need a shepherd. I need somebody to lead me, to show me the way that I need to go. So God, right now, I ask you to forgive me. And I ask you to come into my life and begin to change me from the inside out. And if you pray that prayer with me, I want to encourage you to please let us know Just go to the contact page on our website and let us know that you made a decision to follow Jesus. But for many of you, you're already a part of God's family. You are one of his sheep, but you are not experiencing the peace that the good shepherd offers. And maybe you're carrying around a burden that you don't need to carry. Or maybe you're not pursuing obedience. Instead, you may be pursuing your own way. And you found that's a path that you don't need to go down. Well, let me challenge you to respond today in obedience. Don't just walk out of here or say, well, I went to church today. No, begin to allow God to change you from the inside out. Begin putting into practice some of the things we talked about today. Choosing to make God the number one priority in your life. Daring to be different from the world by living a holy life. Denying yourself and most importantly being obedient. But I know for some of you on the day of your salvation you gave God your sin. But the truth is you've taken back your heart. And let me challenge you to today to come back to him and to surrender fully and totally to him. And if you have made a decision today or you have questions or something specific you want us to pray for, again, let me encourage you to take advantage of our online communication card at discoverrealife.net slash contact and let us know. And I'm going to pray now for all of us And then our worship team is going to come and close us singing praises to Jesus, our shepherd. My Heavenly Father, God, I thank you that you are the good shepherd. I thank you that you have set us on a path of righteousness for your name's sake not because of how good we are or not because of all the things we have done. Thank you that you're a shepherd that when we stray off the path that you lead us back onto the path. 
So God, tonight, today, I just pray that your spirit would draw us to yourself. Convict us of sin that's in our life. Lead us to a point of repentance and a a point of turning back to you and surrendering fully each and every part of our lives unto you. God, we worship you and we give you glory and praise and honor as the good shepherd. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. There's a grace when the heart is under fire Another way when the walls are closing in When I look at the space between Where I used to be and this reckoning I know I will never be alone There was another in the fire Standing next to me, there was another in the waters, holding back the seas. Should I ever need reminding of how I've been set free? There is a cross that bears the burden, where another died for me. There is another in the fire. Sing it together. And all my dead left me dead beneath the waters. I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore. And should I fall in the space between what remains of me and the striking me? Either way, I will bow to the things of this world. I know, I know I will never be alone. There is another in the fire standing next to me. There is another in the waters holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding what power set me free? There is a grave that holds no another in the fire Whoa There is another in the fire Whoa There is another in the fire Whoa There is another in the fire Whoa And I can see Bows to head, I can hear the roar in the heavens as the space between where's thin. I can feel the ground shape beneath us as the prison walls cave in. Nothing stands between us, nothing stands between us. No. There's no other name but the name that is Jesus. He who was and still is and will be through it all. So come what may in the space between all the things that seem and this reckoning. I know I will never be alone. Sing it out. And I know. Should I ever need reminders? 
I can see the light in the darkness as the darkness bows to him. I can hear the roar in the heavens as the space between words then. I can feel this ground shake beneath us as the prison walls cave in. Nothing stands between us, no. Nothing stands between us. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name. There is no other name but the name that is Jesus. He who was and still is and will be through it all. So come what may in the space between all the things I've seen and this reckoning. I know I will never be alone. See it out, I know. I know I will never be Thank you so much for joining us for worship this weekend. Let me encourage you to choose one of those six practices for peace and put it into practice this week. Maybe you'll choose the first one, which is choose joy. It simply means to put Jesus first, others second, and yourself third. So try that this week and see if it'll give you a greater sense of peace in your life. We'll see you next week.